Hello, today we're covering Hilton Worldwide Holdings, ticker HLT. Over the next few minutes, I'll discuss my thoughts on both the business quality and its valuation. We have a market cap of $36.4 billion, enterprise value of $44.1 billion. So you see about $5 billion in net debt on this business, which is only about 10% of the overall enterprise value. That's not really a significant chunk. They're operating in the hotel, restaurant, and leisure industry. So they are a hospitality company. They manage, franchise, own, and lease hotels and resorts. It has two different segments, management and franchise as well as ownership they are the hotel management and licensing of its brand so presumably they have franchises that they're basically earning franchise fees from would be what i would guess operates luxury hotels under the waldorf astoria hotel and resorts lxr hotels conrad hotels and resorts lifestyle hotels which is canopy by hilton curio collection by hilton tapestry collection by hilton Tempo and Model, so basically the Hilton brand, um, Homeward Suites, Home to Suites, so all sorts up and down from luxury to non-luxury brands of hotels. So they're basically leveraging the Hilton brand for hotels and uh, restaurants worldwide. So beta 1.22, about 22% more volatile than the average S&P 500 stock. Let's go down to the return on invested capital. Now, it's interesting that we only have data back to 2010. Maybe there's a spinoff of this or something along those lines. But in 2011 is when our data starts here. You see they start with 2.7% return on invested capital, 1.9, 2.3, 4, 8, 2, 10, 9, 10. They lost money in 2020. Not surprising due to COVID. Hotels did terribly during 2020. They made money again in 2021, and they're doing very well um, in 2022. So... Overall, it looks like the return on invested capital has been improving over time. I don't really know what their asset picture is, but when we get to the balance sheet, we're going to get a better understanding of what's going on there, um, and we'll tie this back to the overall profitability. In general, these numbers are lower than what I'd like. I mean, when we look here at these 10-year median returns, we see the return on invested capital of 6.5%. Again, I really like seeing double-digit numbers, and we have exceeded that you know, basically three years here, 2017, 2018, 2019, and then, of course, 2022 at 14.5%. These numbers are getting better and better, so that is a good sign. When you see a positive trend like that, that means the incremental returns are even higher, and so you do like to see that as a shareholder. Um, but what's impressive is, What's impressive is they've turned a 6.5% return on invested capital into a 20% return on equity. At the end of the day, return on equity is what matters, and 20% is very, very good. So I'm excited to see a 20% return on equity for this company. It makes it more interesting as a potential investment because we're exceeding my threshold target of 15%. If I want returns as a shareholder of 10, 12, 15%, then I need my return on equity to be higher than that. But at minimum, reach that. And so when you hit 20%, we're saying, hey, easily, you can self-fund all the growth you need in order to hit your return target. I like seeing that that is a good thing for us here. Now, um, price to earnings ratio of 29, the first thought is, hey, this is a pretty expensive stock. And you can see when you see these EV to EBITDA ratios, 18.6, 19.8, 25.3, 26.5, this is not a one-off. This is not a surprise. It's not like this is a mistake. This is just an expensive stock. You know, average S&P 500 company is going to trade at about 15 over the course of its history. You're almost double the average price of an S&P 500 stock. So the market's saying, hey, this is a high quality business. You're going to have to pay up for it. That is what we see here, trading close to 30 times earnings. I'd say it's probably overvalued based upon our 10-year CAGR here of negative 0.6%, which is basically flat. You do have declining assets, but they've been growing their earnings. So that this is a nice setup that they've been able to grow their earnings at 14% a year, even though revenue has been flat. So we need to do a deeper dive on that with some of these financials. What we can see is the revenue kind of jumps all over the place. 9.7 billion, 10.5, 7, 6, 8, 8, 9, 4, 5, 8. Now, of course, 2020 was a terrible year. 2021, terrible year here. Um, nothing surprising there. What is impressive is, that they, is they've been able to manage, you know, 50% decline in revenue and still maintain positive gross profits. So that is good um, in that sense. But I think part of that is the, you know, the franchising aspect of this business it tends to be a very high quality cash flow type business. So I like seeing that. You do have negative operating profit again in that 2020 year, but otherwise they only have one year in the last, you know, 13 years that has not been profitable. I'm okay with that from, a, you know, still being a high quality business. Now you can see that they started out the decade at $1.35 earnings per share and they ended it at 453. So that's tripling in the decade. 
Um, very impressive growth. You know, anytime you can triple your earnings in a decade, that's very good for shareholders because it means you could potentially triple your stock. Um, there has been, of course, volatility because you can see they already hit the four dollar range in 2015, but then they had to cascade back down. So even though revenue is below where it was in 2013, they're actually much more profitable on an earnings per share basis. I'm going to guess that they've also retired a lot of shares because they only doubled their operating profit and yet they tripled their EPS, which means you probably had a lot of buybacks. So that's actually really exciting. You can also see the operating margin doubled. They went from 11.3% to 23.9%. So there's a lot of operating leverage in this business, which is another very positive sign that you like to see in a stock. They have been paying dividends, but it's not been you know straight up or anything like that. They've had to increase it, decrease it. It's not something I would rely on as an investor here based upon their history. Uh, okay, so overall, pretty interesting company so far. The valuation seems really high, but otherwise, this looks like a high-quality business with a very intriguing history with some improving fundamentals. So let's dive into the income statement. Now, before we do, hit that like button. Don't forget to subscribe. Let's go to the income statement. SGNA, look, look at this. This is impressive. So you began the decade with $748 million in SGNA. You ended at 382 this is incredible. It is very hard to reduce your SGNA over the course of a decade. And yet they've been able to do that even though they have higher gross profit. So what they've done is gross profit has only gone up 400 million. It's really important to stress this. Gross profit went from 2.4 billion to 2.8 billion. It's up $400 million. And yet the operating profit is up $1.1 billion. And the way they did that is they were able to increase their gross profit on lower revenue and yet cut out enough expenses to double their operating profit. That is incredible management. Um, very strong management of their operating expenses and their income statement here. This is not normal. And one of the things that I do when I do these quick analysis is I'm looking for things that are not normal. Any sort of exceptional piece of information is a good sign that you have a really interesting stock situation. And that's what I'm seeing here. Um, net interest income. So they are paying a decent amount, of course, on interest, but it's lower interest than they did a decade ago. So again, that's adding a little bit of operating leverage there as well. Um, and I was right, they have bought back some shares. Um, not a ton of shares. Um, you know, They're about 10% down from their shares outstanding in 2013. There's about 20% down from their shares outstanding in 2014. Overall, it's adding one to 2% per year to the EPS growth. Um, it's still pretty good very good outcome and and you're seeing the net income on its own kind of almost tripling when you actually take the net income number even though the operating profit number did not have as big of a boost um, some of that of course coming from the tax cut and jobs act interest income taxes are lower today than they used to be so that's one thing playing into it here but overall pretty good management here you can tell that they've been doing some buybacks as well let's go to the balance sheet now Here's another very good thing. You can see that there's this decline in asset. Now, it does look like maybe they had some sort of spinoff or something here. There was $10 billion in assets that kind of disappeared, uh, but their assets bouncing around a lot. You know, PP&E got reduced massively. Um, they really have done a lot of work to reduce their asset base, and what that's done is anytime you can triple your income, and cut your assets in half, you're gonna get much better returns on invested capital. So what we've done, because of how they've managed this balance sheet, they've reduced their PP&E, they've reduced their goodwill, they've reduced their intangibles, they've reduced these other assets all to much lower numbers, they were able to pull $12 billion in assets out of the business while still increasing profitability. That's what's allowed them to be even more profitable when they have lower revenue because they have fewer assets and it makes the business incredible. You've also reduced their debt a lot. They're $7 billion lower in debt. So that's a good idea because you've been able to not just reduce your assets, but your liabilities have gone down as well. Um, they're operating with negative retained earnings. This is always an impressive thing. So it's just showing that the business is being run without um, a lot of shareholders equity. You see the negative shareholders equity the last four years. And this is caused by buying back shares above book value and then basically being able to return all of your cash to shareholders instead of having to retain it to grow and stay in the business. I like how that is set up. Um, 
it's always a sign again of an exceptional company who's able to do that. Now, you can see this with companies that are getting ready to go bankrupt, but that's not what we see here. We see an improving business situation. So when you have negative book value on a business like this, negative book value being, of course, where assets is lower than liabilities, it either means, again, that it's a red flag or it's an exceptional business. And I think this falls into the exceptional business category. Let's look at depreciation. You can see, of course, that PP and E spending has gone down. Most recently, spending 100 million per year. You began the decade spending close to 400 million a year. So, assuming they're not just deferring all your maintenance, this is actually a really good thing because your depreciation is dropping significantly. So, you're going to have more cash flow than you otherwise would because depreciation here is 600 million. Now, depreciation below 200 million because as you get fewer and fewer assets, there are fewer things to depreciate. That's a good sign there. You did have to issue shares in 2013. That's what I saw. But you've been able to buy back shares for five of the last 10 years. So it's a pretty good sign. Now, they do have stock-based compensation each and every year. I don't like that. Ideally, you'd get rid of the stock-based compensation because it would make the effectiveness of the buybacks even better. Um, but you do have that there. One of the things that just tip, you know, I can see on this kind of usage of cash portion here at the bottom is you're not really consistent in any one thing. You have three years, you know, four years with no buybacks. Um, you have three years with no dividends. Sometimes the debt is going up. Sometimes the debt is going down. Perhaps this means management is opportunistic. Um, but basically, it's really hard to predict what they're going to use their cash for. It does look like they prefer to spend excess cash on buybacks, which is a great sign. I always like it when companies buy back their stock. Um, but it's something to be aware of that it's really hard to predict where that cash is going to go. The key point is, how is the business going to do in the future? Is it going to continue to improve like this? You know, these sorts of numbers here are not as impressive, but when you see something like this, this acceleration to 15%, you know, 14, 15% return on invested capital, you see this massive gap between return on equity and return on invested capital driven largely by the effect that this business is being leveraged and the business is able to be able to pull assets out while growing their profitability. That is a rare sign and it's something that's really interesting. So for me, this is a company I'd want to do more research on. This is a company that I think would go on my watch list because of all these interesting aspects. You have negative book value on a company that's still growing their profits. They were able to triple their earnings over the course of a decade. Return on equity is over 20%. They only have one year of losses, and that's easily explained explained by COVID. There's no clear reason why they would have lost money other than that. Um, it is trading at a high price, but that's exactly what a watch list is for. We identify the companies we want to own. When they're at a high price, when the price drops, we have the opportunity to potentially buy them. So Hilton's going to make my watch list. Hope you enjoyed learning from this video. Hit that like button. Don't forget to subscribe. You can check out my full watch list in the playlist up above. And if you want to check this out, the affiliate link to quickfs.net, which is the software I'm using today, can be used for free or paid using my link. It's a great way to support the show because I can get a commission if you sign up using my link. So thank you for listening. Till next time, stop paying fees, start building wealth.